Roxanne Chmielewski, Melanie Alt, and then David um, is the president. So just a little background on DDA, because not I haven't been in front of all of you before, just so you know who we are. Um, David started the company about 30 years ago. He's a civil engineer by trade, um, started on the uh, finance side, so doing bond sales, TIF districting, economic development. And then about seven years ago, our clients came to us and said, hey, we really need help in human resources. So we started doing org studies and executive recruitment and then grew into class and comp. So today we also are the technical um, HR experts for AMC. So if someone from the county calls asking an HR question, it's our staff that's answering that. Um, we have about 450 government clients that are in Minnesota. Um, and I always say that we're different than most consultants because we've all been either in city or county government. Um, so I think that that helps when we're producing practical results. So the project scope. So in 2022, we did a market analysis to see where you were to the market. Um, we did address some job classifications at that point. Um, we recalibrated the grid. And then this year is we're, redo, we're going into ongoing maintenance. So part of the reason um, counties do ongoing maintenance, it's like I would say your highway payment improvement plan. You do small things every year so you don't have a huge wage gap, just like they look at the conditions of the roads. Your employees are your greatest asset, but they're your biggest <coughs> part of the budget. So looking at your pay, your competitiveness every year and adjusting it um, help so you don't have wage gaps. You can kind of stay up with the trends in that. Um, so this year, our goal is to review a third of the job descriptions, um, which include the grades 87 through 91, and then um, your HHS department. So the goal would be to review those, um, and then also look at current classifications, jailers, appraisers, engineering techs, and um, nurses. So one of the things that we're finding when we're doing market analysis throughout Minnesota is what positions are really having a hard time are those that are technical, like with the certifications such as appraisers, engineering, techs, and nurses. Um, jailers just are one of those that happen to be a high turnover position. So looking what you can do to keep what you have and when you recruit, recruit good talent. Um, Part of our other work will be market analysis, making sure what we do complies with pay equity. So every three years, the county has to do a pay equity report. And that basically states, here are the jobs we have at the county. Here's what their comp worth or their points are based on their job description. And here's how many male and females we have. So you have to do that every three years. If you aren't in compliance or fail to do it, you could lose Gover um, county government aid. Um, that's part of the package of doing it. So um, other things that we help with are the, if they get it up and running, the AMC, LMC salary survey um, data, HR assistance, writing job descriptions, classifications. And then the goal would be, um, if we can get through this, is in 2024 to move potentially out of merit. So you would have one pay grid. Just to, just to take ex found on the pay equity part. Pay equity is really local. I mean, the, the pay equity and how our pay grid fits and works in Goodyear County is dependent on who we have employed in Goodyear County. We can't take our pay equity and, and our grid and move it to Houston County and say it's going to come up with the exact same pay equity score. Yep because their employees are different in the makeup than our employees or Olmsted or anybody. It is really local and it is driven by the mix of your employees at the local level. Yeah, so pay equity, I mean, it, it's supposed to make sure that male and females are paid the same. So it looks at the comp worth in the organization. It doesn't look at external competition. So any other what other counties are doing it only looks at what you're doing and again it is based on the makeup of your employees because how pay equity is determined is it basically creates a regression line so it looks at the male dominated jobs and what the deviation between those are for either male or female jobs that's where you have issues with pay equity and you would have to correct those in order to pass so just to to go just a one step farther in that so if County A has um, 
certain grade jobs that are mainly male dominated and and another county has that same pay grade but it's female dominated those are those don't work together at all you can't compare them really across that at all and where i'm getting at that is if you look at if you look at the counties we compare to some of them have probably more female domination at the administrative or at the higher level and we have more male domination at that level and that tips the scale one way or the other yeah whereas when you get wherever you get maybe one county has more females in their sheriff's department than we have in our sheriff's department and that just the scales just tip so it is you really can't it's really almost impossible to compare that across the board when you're talking about pay from one one county to another county because of that they may have a totally right the different only adjustment. thing you could look at via counties is like the comp worth maybe if they all use the same system so you guys use the hay system which is also used by the state um you could say our job should be pointed the same but even in that it's not because of different service levels and you might require a different degree because you expect them to do something so even that is not apples to apples that's why i mean this is a, it's a messy thing because if you think of just your whoops sorry your pay structure you have to have updated jobs descriptions you have to have a classification that ranks them for pay equity and then it goes into now where do you want to be to the market and how do, how competitive do you want to do, be and how do you want to pay employees so um, all of that takes in even the amount of steps impacts pay equity how long it takes someone to get there if everyone does and then benefits like how if everyone has the same benefits or what so um it is a very complicated um system and the other thing is it's always moving because as soon as you finish it's like road project as soon as you seal the final coat somebody drives over it and it starts to wear well it's the same with this i mean right now i would say in county governments you have a lot of counties doing studies because there's a labor shortage. So when you used to put out an applic, you know, get applications, you used to maybe get 100 to 50 applicants. You may be only getting 10, 15, and of that, maybe only five are really qualified. Mm -hmm. um, the private sector entry level retail jobs are between 18 and 24 bucks. So that's starting to then push competitiveness. Um, and then, like I said earlier, you have some specifically technical jobs in county government that. There's not a lot of people going to school for, and their licensures take so long that that pay is causing there to be less people in there, and um, have counties are just having to adjust how they hire those. So there's a lot going on, unfortunately. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so from the last time we met, um, we tried to do one pay grid we didn't achieve, so we still have HHS as kind of their own. Um, you currently have pay grids are different percentages, not between the same steps. We did eliminate um, that 80.5, that really weird grade, um, and that fixed seven of your jobs. Um, and then the, one of the goals was to reduce compression. So compression can be um, if I am the supervisor and you're my direct report. There's a very compressed pay between us. So there's really not an incentive for you to take my position. Um, so that's one of the things. The other compression you can sometimes have. So that would, I would say, be vertical. Um, you could also have horizontal. So if you move to a new pay grid and I've been here five years and now let's say that's going to be the start of the pay grid and you just come in and we're making the same, there's a compression issue there or a leapfrog effect. So um, that was one of the things we tried to achieve last time. We didn't get there. We didn't make all of the changes to do that. But so that kind of says kind of what we worked on and kind of what we're going to focus in on this time. Isn't that a struggle with the uh, where the wages are getting at? Just take a $5 <coughs> an hour wage. You know, you could say, well, they can take a different lesser job and work one hour of overtime. But that's, you know, that's $60, which could be that's already a dollar and a half right well you know, for the supervisor so even if you go to four is that going to be enough 
Is six going to be enough? For sure. Or is, I mean, where's it going to end? Yeah, overtime is, a, I mean, a beast of its own to watch. I mean, right. uh, when I was a city administrator, my public works guys would make more than me a lot of the time because of overtime. If there was a water main break or plowing, they get time and a half. Uh, you know what I mean? So you always have that issue. So it's just looking at it and how can you somehow incentivize people to want to take that. So goals would be um, to address compression. So one way of doing that, you could create more grades. Um, you have some space in between some of your grades or add to the top, you know, kind of adjust everyone. Um, address trying to get to one pay grade. So to move HHS over would be a goal so that everyone is on one pay grade. It'd be easier to manage um, equitable to all employees. That would help pay equity too because there would be similar pay for all employees address um, grades 87 through 91 um, look at your entry level pay so where is that to the market so those um, grades that are lower paid where are they competitively to your private sector retail jobs and then um, look at those targeted jobs so like the appraisers the jailers look at those and see what we can do with those We talked a little bit about this. I'm just going <coughs> to kind of give the 10,000 foot level because it does get confusing when we start talking about pay grids and pay structure and pay equity. A compensation program is structured pay plan used to basically attract your um, qualified professionals and retain employees. So that's like your min to max, your step system. Your pay plan, which is another level that includes your job descriptions, your pay equity, your market analysis of that, um, your market definition. So who are you being compared to industry size, geographic location, tax capacity, and then the pay philosophy. That's where the board comes in and says, you know what, if this is going to be our benchmark group, how do we want to influence that? Like when we come back and say, here's where you are to the market, how do we want to influence that? How do we want to pay our employees? What does that look like? That's what you would consider a pay philosophy. And then your compensation pay philosophy, which is set by you, again, you get to decide what that group is, what includes your objectives, um, and where you want to be. So again, it takes that pay plan, their pay grid, kind of creates a whole pay plan around your job descriptions, positions, and then setting that comp pay philosophy of this is where Goodhue County wants to be. So, and that again is set by the board. Um, we talked a little bit about this. I'll just briefly go over that pay equity. It reviews each position's comp worth, doesn't include market data. Um, the classification of the job is based on the evaluation system. So the Hay system looks specifically at know-how and knowledge. So education or experience needed for the position. Again, it doesn't look at the person in it. So. I was a city administrator, have a doctorate degree. That's not required, so it wouldn't look at that. I'm also a TIG welder. It wouldn't look at that as well. It only is what the job has, not what the person brings in. Um, Can it, it look at how difficult it is to fill the job? Yeah, well, and that's how you would pay the position. So pay equity is not, again, looking externally. It's only looking at internally to making sure within your organization you are paying equitably. So to your point, it doesn't say, oh, there's going to be an issue where we have to pay more. That could be something when you are paying employees, that's what you explain. Well, we pay this position different because it's a hard to recruit position. We can't get anyone in there or something like that. But pay equity only looks at internal. It's not looking at that external piece. Okay. Um, again, can you make adjustments? Yes, one time fix, but it impacts the rest of pay equity, kind of what you said. It is a domino effect. If you just pick and choose, we're just going to change this one position, it can really impact the overall um, results of pay equity. And again, it does depend on male or female positions, who's in there. So, for example, if Scott left, that became female, that would change the whole dynamic of pay equity. So it really depends on who's in the position as well. So, and that fluctuates every day when you guys have people leaving and coming in, what they're replacing. So the pay equity continues to move as well. Yep. I talked briefly with um, Dominic Murray. Murray of the state about pay equity. 
because of the fact that we were having such trouble hiring certain jobs like an IT and um, engineers. <coughs> And asking her about, is that something that we could offer an incentive to pay more to be able to attract those? Um, and no, not, with, not without affecting pay equity. But then there, on the flip side, there's also public health nurses, which is a, primarily a female dominated. So I was asking whether or not if that rose at the same time could um, could that offset one another? And she seemed to think that it could. The other thing with numbers, and maybe you can explain this a little bit better for me. She said that currently Goodhue County is at 105% or 105 points, whatever it is. And she said, it's really a pass fail and 80 is the number that you have to meet. So that there is wiggle room there for us to do some things and not go below 80 yep. since it's pass fail. Yes, yeah, so you have to you have to get 80% and that means underpayment ratio. So you can't have a, a underpayment ratio that would be um, smaller than 80% if that makes sense. So it looks at exactly all of the male positions and the female and says which one is underpaid and then it draws that regression line. So I don't remember what your score is offhand, but you do right about 100. It is. So you have some wiggle room with that, but it is amazing to see what one job can undo or do. I mean, even when I, I do pay equity reports for probably 40 organizations, and if I just enter something wrong, like one number, you know, in it can change the whole report. So you do have room, um, it, but it again, it determines, it really is, I'm just, it's like a regression line. So if this starts out at your lowest paying jobs to your top paying jobs, it really is that deviation. So the public health nurses are probably in the middle to the top. So if you change it there, that you're passing okay. But if your IT and those engineering techs are slightly below, or right there, it could undo what you just did. So then from going to 100, you could fail. Like, so you can test it, that's part of what right. we do. And that's why when we run any scenario, we always run it through pay equity to make sure that we're not undoing what your intent is. And again, that's why you do it every three years. So you can correct and then kind of test to see if we change this, how does it work and how will it implement for year one, two and three until we report didn't, again. Didn't we move like 15 points this last time we did it? I think it was like over 20. We over were 20. at 120% and we moved down to about 100. So we moved halfway to the 80. Right. That's what you're saying. Just a question. So you said we use the hay method. Yep. And the state uses that. Other methods out there are they are they similar? If you were to take what the hay says ours is, and you moved it over, and you took Joe's plan over here, yep. would they be pretty much uh, even, or would it change? I mean, the input changes everything. Sure. Whatever you put in, yep. will spit out this, but. If you took exactly two jobs, would you said would they come out the same pretty much um, between two different system philosophy or paid group? Yeah. So you if you're if you're looking at the classification systems, I mean we use probably eleven different systems. So we have two of our own, but we have learned or become trained in other systems. They all work very similar. Um, I will say that some systems are made for public sector jobs. So when it looks at work conditions, it's different than maybe some of them that were created in the public sector or private sector. So the one example I always give is some consultants will use and say, oh, you work in the courthouse, great working conditions. Really, have you ever met anyone coming into the courthouse that was happy? And you know what I mean? So there's, it's not, I mean, I was a city administrator. I had death threats against me. People don't like, you know what I mean? So it's not always the best work environment. And that's not always looked at because they don't. Um, but for the most part, they all equal out. Now with that said, like if your job in the Hay system is let's say um, 429 points, it could be a thousand points in a different system. That doesn't mean it ranks it different. It's just that, overall 
their comp worth is just looked at a little bit different. But I always say the market tells you if your system is doing what it's supposed to, because if you have peaks, you're overpaying to what the market is. So you're overvaluing that position. And that might be totally relatable because of the service level and the uniqueness of the job. But if you have valleys, that also means you're underpaying. So why? And I always say that's the first place to look at as a misclassification because the one thing that all jobs are supposed to look at is those job descriptions and what's needed for the job problem. And however they look at it, they look at them a little bit different, but at the end of the day, they look at them very similar. So I don't think it matters what classification system you use as long as you're A, using it consistently, I would say B, using it objectively. A lot of times when they're done internal, it becomes, well, this is my department and I think I, my admin assistant is rated higher. And then you start to ruin the integrity of the system because you're manipulating it to get the results you want, not letting the system do what it was intended to do. So if you change the points and say, well, we want a grade 80 to go from here to there, and you don't adjust points on everything else, you're throwing it out of whack. Um, you could change the points that make a grade 80, that you could make it really narrow or really wide. That that you could do and that wouldn't impact because it still would align. But you couldn't say, and we've seen entities do this, where they say, you know what, we're just going to add 50 points so we can get you to that next grade. Well, that ruins the integrity right. of the system. And if you ever were audited, PACWIDI would say, you can't justify that. And so that's kind of, I think to your point, you can't just move <coughs> someone. You could say a grade 80 in your current system, let's say is 160 to 180 for points. I don't know offhand, that's what it is. You could shrink that or make it larger or whatever. That would be fine, but then those points then go to the next one, which means you're gonna pay them still higher than what it was. So as long as you move everything, you couldn't just kind of shrink one and then keep. So, so I guess to my point is, <clears throat> if you manipulate the system to do what you want it to do, yeah. you ruin the integrity of the whole system. And that's kind of what we found with your 80.5. You had some positions that were paid higher but had less points, and that was impacting your pay equity. Because it right. looks at those points and says, if Scott and I have the same points, we should be paid the same. If he has more, is paid more and has less points or the same, then there's an inequity. Is it the market that kind of really can throw things off though? Like you can have two jobs in those all those grades or levels that are way off and all of a sudden then what do you do? Yeah. And I think that's where it all kind of all started was our, our jailers. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were we were losing them because we just weren't paying enough. I mean, so the, the market I think has more a lot more importance, I feel. I understand you have your system and everything, but I think that that's what people are seeing is the market. I can go out there. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Your your employees don't care at all about pay equity. They care about the market competitiveness because that's what they bring home. They don't mm -hmm. care that you went down 20 points or that you go up 20 right. points. They care what matters to them is what you bring home. And that is all external. That is all industry. And that's all economy related. So what you pay today isn't going to be the same what you paid in 2008 because the economy was very different states. So that's why I think part of this process is looking at it so you make adjustments as all of those wheels that are changing change, you change accordingly so you don't have a huge wage gap or you know get into the other aspect where you have some positions you just can't hire for. And I guess that's where my issue is, is all of a sudden they're on that same grade and we do need to adjust, but mm -hmm. we're going to adjust everybody. And did are they justified in that or are they because the system says they have those points, so that, that changes. Yep. so you just have to also. test, like if you said, oh, we're just gonna adjust that one grade, if that's what you did, you would have to test it and see. And like I said, you might pass this year, but you might not next year. So you wanna create some solutions that are more permanent, do you know what I mean? And there's a lot of, I mean, we can get into that jailer mm -hmm. position in particular, what other entities are kind of doing and what we're, seeing just as trying to be competitive and keeping who you have. Thank you. Um, so your current classification, we kind of said is the Hayes system. Your county positions are under one grid. HHS is under several grids. 
um, your county passes pay equity. Um, you could improve it some. This fluctuates again. We just talked about this by who's the incumbent. And then um, you have some county positions that are compressed internally just because of where their pay equity is or adjustments that are made. So having more than one pay grid also alludes to that because if you're on HHS pay grid and we have the same points and you're paid differently, that ill imp impacts um, pay equity. So one grid is always ideal because it's easy to maintain, but it also helps with pay equity because everyone is paid the same. So um, other concerns with your current system, it's mm -hmm. um, county is not fully competitive with benchmarks and industry. Um, your, you know, your last pay grid, we adjusted some of that, but example, even the CDL licensure changes is really going to impact your highway department. So one, the training isn't available like it used to be, and then keeping those is going to be harder and harder. So that's an issue. We talked a little bit about the labor shortage. Again, that entry level retail pay has increased. Um, you have a compression with staff and supervisors, so there's no incentive to become a supervisor or there's more of an incentive for me to say, you know what, done supervising, just going to go back to program, you know, management or whatever that is. So you're, you know, un, um, you're having Ill, of, Ill impacts that way too, where it's not an incentive to be a supervisor. Um, some of the reality of your current system, um, you lost for example, 13 appraisers in the last 10 years. So again, that's one of those specialized licensures that you're not unique in losing. Maybe that's a higher rate, but that's a hard position to recruit because there aren't as many people going to school for it and the laws have changed of what you need in order to do it. So that's part of that. Um, fewer applicants just when you have an open position um, and then positions are open much longer than in the past. So usually you had that kind of close date. You kind of sealed the deal. I know you've had some positions that have been open months or you just years. have years. OK, so you haven't been able to get the applicants that are qualified for the position. So that's causing an issue there, too. Um, so part of the whole market analysis and this gets to your market competitive is making sure you have a group that you think you compete for talent. So I always say who hugs you because that's usually the easiest one. Who do you steal from? Who steals from you? Um, but other ones are your geographic location, population, services, tax capacity, expenditures. Um, who do you lose employees to and who do you recruit? So that's kind of how you create that benchmark list. Um, and with that, <coughs> you start to say if these are our groups that we compare ourselves to now is that pay philosophy of why do you pay the people the way you do are you competitive are you competitive with the market are you competitive with your benchmarks um, internal equity making sure you don't have pay compression in what your pay adjustments look like that's that pay philosophy so even if you have your benchmark group you still have to have a pay philosophy of where do we want to be in relation to that group? Do you need water? Okay, sorry. All right, carry on. All right. And again, that pay philosophy is where do you want to be? How do you want to pay your employees? Establish comp worth so that internal market competitiveness with the pay equity and external, you want it to be based on work performance, comply with pay equity, um, and also provide transparency to communicating with employees. So however the board decides this is how we're going to pay, somehow you need to communicate that so people know. Because it's e anyone can pull the data, and I'm sure you have people who say, well, I know so-and-so is making X amount at whatever county. Well, that's great information, but you don't know what their pay philosophy is. Why do they do what they do? You don't have an idea of all of the other positions. I mean, like I said, there's all these moving targets. So um, just one job is not a good, well, that's what you should make because what about if they pay their other positions a lot lower? Then, you know what I mean? So it's making sure that you 
are looking at all of the data and when you use that for your market analysis. So, so oh, just yep. for example, so if I looked at Dodge County, which their health and human or their human services is not under Dodge County, it's under Min Prairie. Yep. That takes a whole group of employees out of the county's pay grid. Really, For sure. And really their there. pay equity looks different because you think about taking all those positions out, how many positions are you removing? So even then they have less positions than to be in compliance with and the makeup of those positions is very different. Very so, different. Yeah, so all of those things, I mean, I even say when you have just some slight, like some counties will um, farm out some appraisal work, even bringing that in, you know, changes how you do appraisal work or who's doing it, is it, con you know what I mean? So that's why I say it's, who do you look like? So it's easy to say we look like these counties because of our populations, but who do you act like? So what services are really apples to apples? And like another piece of it is, is do you look the same during the day than you do at night? Like businesses versus a county that doesn't have any business in it. Looks very, you know, stagnant. So that all impacts too um, with what you're trying to do. And these benchmarks um, have been set, I would say, and they've been in arbitration. Yes. So when people say, well, who should we be looking at? I think this is a good list. If you undo something in arbitration, you better have good reason for doing so um, because that sets the past precedent and like going forward, they'll come back to that group. So th those are the benchmarks that are listed before you. Now with that, that's where the board gets to set that, how do we wanna pay with them? Cause some of those counties are smaller, some are larger. So where should Goodhue County be? And could you take those counties <clears throat> and weight certain counties different than other counties? For sure, so that's a great question. So, um, one thing that we do different is we don't just come in and say, here's where you are, here's a regression line, statistical analysis, we're to the market, good luck. We will come in and say, here's where you are to the market. But again, where do you wanna be or what counties are you more like? So we'll have some counties that will rank or weight themselves to say, if we have 10 counties, we really wanna be in that top four because those are the four counties that are most like us. So we wanna be paying at that level. Um, we'll have other counties that will take these and they set their pay philosophy based on two or four counties to say, you know what, this is exactly where we want to be. I have one city that takes one of their benchmark and says we're going to be 10% higher than them. So they use all of them, but when they average it, that's how their pay grid is set, is to say we want to be 10% competitive of whatever, or the opposite. We know that um, Rochester pays more money and we're always going to be b below them, but we want to make sure our gap is only 10%. So that's where those pay philosophies are different and no county pays the same. So even if the wages like for one position, I can guarantee you it's not for all of them because of what we just said. And again, their pay philosophy, even if Dodge County used these same benchmarks, their board is going to have a different way of paying their employees, so it's not going to be apples to apples. Yep. One of the things that I believe is on here when you're deciding your pay philosophy, and that is the tax base that you're even dealing with. So each one of these counties has a different tax base that they can even draw from. Exactly. So, I mean, so I always say it's important for the board when you look at your benchmarks and when you set that pay philosophy is what indicators set you aside from other counties or what makes Goodhue County, Goodhue County. So we just did a study for Cook County. They have one of their benchmarks is Hennepin County because they look at their lodging and hospitality tax rate, what they bring in from tourism based on population. And that was one of their entities that they felt they best match. They have no housing, you know, so all of their indicators that are important to them aren't going to be what's maybe important to Goodhue or what sets you aside. But that's where I think counties forget, like, this is really your chance as a board to say, what is important to Goodhue County? Who do we really look like, act like, 
and maybe who do we want to be? Um, do you know what I mean? To who you strive to pay like, even if it's not them, who are we always looking in our rear view mirror at to make sure that they're either behind us or that we stay slightly, I know, along with them. Thank you. Um, concerns that were brought up last time, um, and you can add more to these, but you know, it doesn't include some counties that border like Dakota. Um, you are close for employees to drive to Metro County. So even though they're not included, you're not that far away from someone who wanted to drive. And even now with there being work from home in Hennepin County, I mean, all of that adds to where people can work, you know, where they live, doesn't have to be where they work. Um, so looking at that, should you set your pay philosophy above your benchmarks average? Um, the counties you use were in arbitration, so your labor attorney is very firm that you don't deviate from that. So keeping the benchmark group the same, so you're looking at the same group, but maybe looking at how you influence that market. That's kind of our discussion. Um, can you use a benchmark group, set that, and to your point, you could be in the 90th percentile or the top third of your benchmark group to say we have these benchmark groups, but we're going to be in the top third. That's how we're going to pay um, employees. That could be a pay philosophy. So you're still using the same benchmark, but you're setting it where you want to be as a ranking kind of. Um, so competitive, again, board selects a benchmark communities. You have a market analysis. Where are you compared? That's kind of where the data comes in. Um, where do you want to be adjusting your pay structure and then ongoing maintenance? So I think part of, you know, even if you adjusted the pay grid, you have some issues where, well, some counties are offering hiring bonus incentives. Is that something that's part of pay, but that's not part of the pay grid, but other ways of dealing with some of those issues that you're seeing. So you have to kind of look at the whole picture when you're doing this for your pay um, analysis. Yeah. So <clears throat> if one was going to look at um, retention pay or retention bonus or a sign on bonus, does that get incorporated into then the um, pay, the pay not the pay philosophy, pay but the pay equity. Thank you very much. <clears throat> if you offer it to all employees, if you start segmenting it, it's only going to be offered to this group or this group, then you have to put, it's the same as like your health insurance. If you offer different plans, you just put in there that you either have longevity or pay or performance or whatever, and you just have to indicate that. All right, that was one of the things that Domin Dominic said that um, we could, or that a county could look at um, doing something like that but then you're right, you have to offset it somewhere else. And like well. the hiring is different because it <clears throat> wouldn't impact their range. So that probably wouldn't impact it. But if you add on like a retention, I'm going to say bonus or something, yeah. then that does impact their min and max. Do you know what I mean? Because the hiring bonus would still be, I would still be within this range. So that's what pay equity looks at but anything above this range impacts it. So it really depends if you're doing the hiring or the retention, then you have to just make sure what you're doing is consistent or what it's impacting. She did also say that if you had really a high difficulty hiring certain jobs, yep. that you could go to the state and explain, look, here's what we'd like to do and here's why, because we can't hire somebody, we can't keep somebody. And yep. like I say, there are a few jobs that we run into with that. Yeah, um, you definitely can do um, what they would consider as a market adjustment. You would have to explain to them. And so when they audit, they would have to take into considerations and they get to decide then if, yeah, we'll accept that or no, we won't. Thank you. So some things to consider is what you currently have, what, <clears throat> I kind of listed, you know, what we did, some things that we still have concerns on. So some now the question is, well, so what? What does that mean? What can we do? So some things are you could increase the number of grades. So I think you have 79 to 90, 91, 91 right now. So you can increase the number of grades. Um, 
maintain steps or um, decrease. So you could kind of say if you have 10 steps, you could go to nine steps. You could cut off that first one, add on, um, pay all employees the same or maintain difference for upper management. So some counties will pay different for leadership positions than they will for other positions. Some will pay different by non-exempt versus exempt positions, um, meaning their percent between steps could vary or they're looking at a different market for those. Again, that's a pay philosophy um, kind of situation of how do you want to influence the market. Reduce the spread between the minimum and maximum rates um, and then kind of defining what is that pay philosophy. But there's a lot of things you can do, I always say, to recalibrate your current structure so it's not completely different um, to change it. But again, all of that comes back to is what is the county's pay philosophy? Can you, can you change exempt positions? Can you adjust some, um, something that's exempt oh, sure. now and you change it back so it's not exempt? You have to go through the FLSA audit and you have to justify why it is or isn't. And again, you can be audited on that too. So you couldn't just say, I want to make Scott hourly because, you know, or whatever that may be. Um, you have to prove why you've undone it. Um, some positions are just really gray because if they supervise, especially, and they're in the field and they're maybe not a technical position, it's those are positions that are more gray but some are very specific if you have to have specific certification or licensure where they would fall into that. So that, I mean, that gets to what you talked about. You take that position here, mm -hmm. it's exempt now, and it didn't take me very many hours of overtime and I'm making more than I am yep. doing this exempt job, which has a different degree of difficulty. Yeah. And there's no way we can pay overtime on an exempt job. Then. Well, you can't make it exempt or non-exempt. I mean, you have to, it would have to pass the test. There are other ways of dealing with, if you wanted to, if you're asking like, how could we pay them um, for working, you know, more than their hours? Because that's kind of where I think it's coming down to is because they're, they're moving down and because they can get the overtime. Sure. You know, can you do uh, overtime after 45 hours? Can you do a, uh, I mean, I don't know what. Sure, so review the overtime. Yeah. Well, and what are examples of how you can uh, incentivize supervising? What are examples? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it depends on what incentivizes them. Some might be more vacation. Some might be um, uh, flexibility, um, paying into their para, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Some will do, um, Thinking of the word, but so you can pay more into their para. You can well, you, you have to a lot a certain amount, or it could be to their. It wouldn't be para though. You're, ta you're talking four fifty seven. Yeah, All right to their retirement. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> so mm -hmm. there are some things if that's what you want to do to incentivize them. I mean, some will do like car allowances. You know what I mean? There's a lot of creative. Some of that still comes into pay equity. Some of it does, yep. Yeah. Depending upon what you do exactly. Yep. Pay equity, yep, has to be has to look at some of that. Some of it it doesn't. And some of it is is who you offer it to. So if you offer it to everyone, then it wouldn't. But if it's offered to a certain group, then you would put that on there. And again, that would maybe depend upon who's in the position. Um, just an example, like it's pretty small, but sorry. Um, if you have your 12 steps, if you reduce step one and two, you kind of add on what I would say is an 11 and 12. You typically don't take away that one and two the first year because you don't want a leapfrog effect. If you come in at step one, you don't want them moving right away. If I'm already at step two, so you kind of leave that, but growing that 11 and 12 and then eventually getting rid of those first two. So you still have 10 steps in the long run, but you're adding on and then taking away at a slower pace, if that makes sense. So. For me, as someone who's in the position, I can see that I have room to grow. Someone coming in still goes in there. You kind of use it as a hiring range so that they don't leapfrog someone that has more tenure. And that's more acceptable to do that than to just move the whole range. Oh, no. you. Th I'm just giving examples. I have a couple. Yep, I have a couple I've of heard, ways. I've heard that mm -hmm. method. 
from several counties where they're going to lop off the front end and add to the back end. Mm -hmm. And then that creates the leapfrog. Whereas if you just move the whole pay scale, mm -hmm. you don't create leapfrog. Yeah. You still create I will a higher. Say, regardless what you do, you're always going to have those weird cases because what you do when you change anything to the pay equity or pay grid is you, if you have a compression issue, it's because of a hiring practice. Because even today, if you and I were both in the application pool. We were both going through interviews. You might negotiate your way at step three, and I just negotiated at step two. So you're already ahead of me, even if we both were for the same position. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So then moving forward, people will say, well, that's not fair. He's been here. I can't undo hiring practices, but you can do things to stop it, like going forward that someone new coming in wouldn't be. But if you hire them at step five, it undoes that. And why do you hire at step five? It's because your pay grid's not doing what it's supposed to do. If you can't bring someone in the door at that step one or two, that means you're not paying enough. Unless they're just a superstar and have all of the experience and you're literally stealing someone, that would be the exception. That's what but, the counties do. Right. We steal from each other. But I mean, if you- We talk about it a lot. <laughs> Right. But if you were, if you like consistently, I'm going to say jailers, you probably aren't hiring them at one or two because you can't get them in the door. So the pay structure isn't doing what it was intended to do because structures are built that you start and you move through the system as you become more competent and your skills and abilities improve. Even if I am a skilled person coming into Goodhue, I'm not going to be competent my first couple of years because Goodhue does things differently. <laughs> Well, when you talk about taking a few years to get rid of steps one and two, how do we ever stay away from it then? How do we ever catch up? I mean, if, if it's taken how many years to get rid of one and two and all of a sudden, wow, now our one and two is off again. And I mean, does it, how do we? You'd have to that? see where people are right now. It might not even be, a, you might have tenure enough where no one is on step two. So if you lopped them off, it wouldn't matter. Um, but then the issue will be is if I'm at step three, do you know what I mean? And that becomes step one. Now you're hiring. So I always say to either create a step zero where you have the hiring range. But again, if HR hires above that, you don't get away from that. I mean, that's part of the hiring process. You just try to be as fair as you can. And that's one way that you can avoid um, that. I mean, I just had a county that when we implemented, we literally undid all HR past practices. So if Scott and I started the same year and he was a step higher, I got moved up. If someone was lower than me, but they had more years of experience, they got moved up. That was a very costly approach. And I don't know that it made everyone feel good. I can tell you that employees were not happy because it's still not going to make everyone happy. So I think you just have to create a fair approach of how you implement, how you move them in, and how they're moving through the structure. So in this example here, you have step one here, 11 and 12. Is there any compression issues between staff at the 11 and 12 and the 11 staff gets two hours of overtime and the 12 doesn't get overtime? Is that so oh for sure that would be that would be an issue and that's sometimes why people will build like a exempt versus not exempt like they just pay different rates some yeah. of that is for that um but if if you and i are in the same grade generally you're usually the same um flsa status i would say <clears throat> uh, maybe 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 not but where it becomes that issue is the supervisor. So if they're only at a step, you know, a grade three, there isn't much room. And if you're at the top, you know, but again, if I'm starting off as in the supervisory role, what is that? And how much overtime are they getting? And why are they getting so much? I mean, there's a lot of questions that go into all of that. You also mentioned that it's possible to, um, make the grades larger? Increase more grades, yep, I can show you. So oh, is that coming? you're right on task. The next one is add more grades. So if this is your current grid, um, I just put in these blue where you have potential, you have enough spread to add another grade. You could add to the top um, and there you would put five in right there. So that would 
allow some room like when we you did the 80.5 you know i think you tried to fix one by moving them to the next grade that helped so that's what sometimes this will do because then it allows you to have more grades to kind of fix some of the compression issues you would have with some of the overtime so that's just an example i mean it's that is not what i'm recommending so if someone photoshops this it's not but that's just an example of you have some room in your grid and how that would look i guess i'm wondering if the the difference between an hourly mm -hmm. position and then you move up to supervisor if the grade could be stretched so that you automatically get paid considerably more because the job does require more sure Yep, and that's part of how you classify those positions, and that would be part of this. Like, let's just say you have some supervisors that were like at that 15 to move them to that new grade or even the one after 16, that might eliminate some of that. So part of it is is looking at where they are in the grid. I mean, I think when we looked at the last one, you had the majority of your were like in one grade so sometimes just fixing that one grade let's just say you have 40 percent of your employees in one grade that's maybe not <clears throat> but sometimes spreading that out can fix it and make it more paid to what the market is because your grades and grid was created a long time ago so it's not maybe reflective of what's going on in the market so you can adjust some of that you still have to justify it with pay equity but you can you have more flexibility when you have more grades, if that makes sense, because you have more movement, you can have less points per grade. Do you know what I mean? So right now, let's say your 81 is 100, and, 100 to 120. If you, if you adjust that, you can make it one to 110, then those just stay there and then there's another one. So reducing that allows you to move people into different grades for the pay equity points. And now would be a time to add the additional grades if we're looking for sure. At HHS coming in. Yeah, for sure. It, I mean, you think about the number of grades you have. Some counties will have 25. Um, you don't have that many. Um, and I think that, it, you know, more grades are better. Even if you don't use them all, it allows you the use in the future when you create positions or supervisory roles or whatever to eliminate some of that. But you do, you have not a lot of grades right now. Knowing what you know of the merit system and all those 17, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, 17 pay grades? Pay What's the classifications? Yeah, the different classifications, like 17 or more than that, maybe. But knowing that, does adding grades, adding levels in here help if we were to move HHS on to oh yeah it allows you more flexibility I mean merit says you have to pay this is the minimum and this is the maximum you have to pay above the minimum and here's the maximum we looked at what we don't know and I've asked is where do they get those numbers from how often are they updated and it's a huge wage spread so like yours let's say is 30 percent theirs might be 64 percent so of course you're going to pay more than their minimum but are you paying where their maximum is? Some of your positions are over the maximum because that's what the um, market is paying. Do you know what I mean? So you can move them. I would say if you're going to move in, you have so many positions that you're moving in and there you have layers and they're paid where they are based on the market, based on the merit system. That would definitely help getting more grades to move all those positions into one grid. And that would help with pay equity because you have some of your HHS that have a seven step system. Some have a nine, some have a, I mean, it's just, they're all over the place. Um, one thing is, I think you talked about like even for some of the supervisors or whatever, one thing you could do is a lump sum merit pay for people at the top step. So. You know, if I have people that get overtime and I'm a good worker, that's sometimes what some people will do. So if I'm eligible for it, what it would look like, that would be set by the board, what percent that would be. So I just gave an example. If I was making $20 and eight cents, um, I was eligible for a merit increase. And let's say the policy said 3%, it would be a lump sum increase and that's what it is. So it's paid out at one time. Um, so you're talking about when you've reached step 
12, 12 right? Yep. You really aren't going to go any higher except for the COLA. Yep. All right. And then you could get a merit increase. And that would be based on like your performance and right. Yep. So for employees, that would be the manager that would do that. <clears throat> so merit seems like a lot of Right. It seems like a lot of work to get there, but I mean, I can see where. Well, and it would be sense. part of budgeting. So like, is it just where you have one or is it multiple based on, I mean, so like when I was at Dakota County, they had pay performance. That's the type and you get different increases based on your performance. This would be saying, hey, we're maxed out. We value the work that you do. You're an except, you know, meeting all expectations or more Then it would be a one time. I would keep it very simple so what it is because you still want to budget for that um so you would have an idea of what that would look like who would be eligible it'd be really easy to say you know of our 200 employees we have 30 that are eligible for it what's the likelihood that they're all getting you know what i mean just because finance is going to need to know with your step system they know this is the cola this is what it will cost this is what the step if they get one what it will be this is added so i would say try to set a policy that's very standard and still easy to um, budget, but you're right. It would have to be based on your performance review, it would have to be by your management and or department head, however you set it up, um, what that looks like. And that can help retention, obviously, or it can For hurt For sure, too. yep. It can hurt some too, right? I mean, some people say, well, I should have gotten that. Right. And then that's, you worry about employee morale. And right, I mean, and it's hard, it's hard to measure. I mean, the way the step system is supposed to work is that if you're meeting your, your, you're meeting your expectations, you should get a step, you know, increase. If you're not, you should be on a performance improvement plan and you shouldn't get an increase. Now, I don't know if that's how you currently do it or not, but a lot of times entities will move people because they're breathing. So you were here another year, you get another step, you get a COLA. This is based on your performance. And a lot of times you'll build it into like if the county has a dashboard, like these are the county board's goals. And if I'm, this is how my work impacts the goals, it's a direct measurement. So you'd be able to measure yes or no, your work didn't or did not qualify for it. I, I can feel I, darts behind me. I'm just saying it can be easy, <laughs> it can be complicated, but. Well, you have to have a really good evaluation system. And you have to, and you have to really follow heads. it and you have to have buy in by supervisors and, and quite frankly, you have to develop a trust with employees that the system works. Right. Because fair. I always yeah. say like merit pay. I mean, if you think about baseball, we hire you to get on first, second, third and occasionally get a home run. That's why we hired you. Right. Mm -hmm. So for employees, that's where we're hiring you to meet expectations. If you're going to get merit, it should be you're exceeding it. Do you know what I mean? Somehow. Mm -hmm. So like consistently in the home run derby or over exceeding those, like if you had a measurement and you blew it out of the park or whatever those measurements are, it's different. Like I'm going to pick on IT, but I, I always get, well, IT, they, my computer went down and they got it up in two minutes. That's their job. That's like when I call 911, I expect the deputy <coughs> You know what I mean? Like, I get it, but that's their job. So, like, if you have to be clear on how you define that. You can create a policy of that, what it looks like, how you would measure that. You could have a committee that can talk about that, who approves it or who doesn't. So, but, but I'm just saying it's a great tool, but you have to have good leadership that can manage it. Because if at the end of the day, everyone over, it just becomes another step, you know, and that's fine if you have exceptional workers and th that might be the case at Goodhue. I, I don't know, but mm -hmm. I would just. My understanding, this is what Dakota County's in. This is how they. So they're in pay per performance, so they don't get steps ever. So they have a huge wage range. So their wage range is like 64% where yours is like 30%. And their increase is a lump sum. So you move through, you get that, whatever that is, and it might fluctuate every year. Well, do they do they do a like a cola that everybody gets yep. and then there's a additional additional pay on top of that or three percent or something it can vary yep and you can get a 
one percent, two percent, three percent, yep. four percent. On and theirs is paid at a lump toll. sum, so you're not moving it with you, if that makes sense. Like the stuff you kind of move with it. <coughs> it you get your cola, you get your lump sum, whatever that is. So in some of the discussions I've had with commissioners from Dakota County is part of the reason they wanted to go to that was when they find a really good employee, they want to accelerate them up. For sure. To keep them versus you're in this step yep. system. So. Well, and it weeds out. I mean, if you consistently get nothing or 1%, are you going to stay? Right. Maybe because you're, if you're not doing anything, but it might not, it might incentivize you to be a better employee or to leave. How does that work with union negotiation? Uh, I have a question. Are Goodyear County's retention issues across the board, or are they more at people at the lower steps or the higher steps? Just the retention is what I'm asking. I would say across the board. Okay. And my question was union, union negotiations. Mm -hmm very difficult you have to be able to justify it because again everyone's going to want the four percent and mm -hmm. how, how do you measure that so well obviously dakota county is doing it and there are other counties that do it it's just harder to do and then justifying it and then making sure you're still paying where you want to and I'm, i've heard so many times we're in competition with dakota county i mean yep. is that the system we need to go to is that I mean, if you're ready to go there, I would say, yeah, but it takes a lot of training. It takes a good performance management system. I came from Dakota County. I think it's a great system, but they have things they could improve on. So it's hard to manage. I mean, you shouldn't have 80% of your people exceeding all expectations, mm -hmm. unless you're just very lucky as a county. Um, but it's a really good way to incentivize people um versus you know well i work harder than so and so but they get the same increase as me every year so it does create that if you have incentivized employees so if but you're it ready takes, it yeah. takes a very aggressive evaluation system right. that's very fair and very and you have to tie well it back to something because you have yeah. people at all different levels and how do you prove that they're you know what i mean so how do you make that tangible how do you evaluate the um, public works employee who drives the truck down the road every day the same as the next guy that right. drives it down the road? Because the jobs day. are different and how do you look, what's exceeding, what's not? Right. It's yeah. really, it, it becomes, it, you, you end up splitting hairs. It's very difficult and I agree with that. I, I but, like the philosophy, but yeah. it's really, and it, it takes a lot, it takes a lot of work to be there and you have to, you have to do the work up front before you switch to it. Yeah, and this would only be for people once they maxed out. So it's just a way of, I would say, to your point, retaining them instead of doing a bonus. You earn it, then you would get that lump sum. But even even to do that, even to do that, you have to have a really good evaluation system leading up to for that sure, because you have to be able to say, but you were doing this, and now you're doing this, or you were doing, yeah, you're, you're doing a much better job now at at 13 years and you were at 12 for years sure. or 10 years. So or you yeah. did something specific. Yeah. Like that year you took on this or you did this to uh, yeah. high you, level. You just have to be able to document it. Yeah, and right. Be able, yeah, it takes you, you have to have a good control. system, but we, you know, we do annual appraisals and they're supposed to be three, four goals at the end of that and that they're usually measurable. So it, you, it's, it certainly can be done. Mm -hmm. No, uh, yeah, no, like I, I agree, it can be done. With, it just with the unions, you would have to get them to agree to it, which I would think they would. Um, and but as far as the, the non-union, you, there's you could implement that and put the process in place at any time. But uh, you'd want to have a good system Great. set up. And just helping people write measurable goals. Mm -hmm. That's I mean, it's not everyone's cup of tea. So. Right. <clears throat> Um, one example is, so we've moved kind of horizontal, you can move vertical, so move everyone one grade, same step. So if I was an 81, step four, I move to an 82, step four. I don't lose my, where I am in the step because of my tenure or where I was hired, but then you get that increase because you're moving it that way. And that's basically a pay grid recalibration. So we've just had one county that did that um 
and your percent between your grades, it ranges from like five to 7%. So that's what that cost, I mean, to go from that would be. So then they added one more grade on top? Yep. So they basically said, you know, grade one, we're going to get rid of and make that whatever grade two was that becomes and then everyone moves. So then that adjusts the whole grid. So that's one thing you could do. And then you could add in a couple. Do you know what I mean? So it's kind of I'm not saying one option is the only option or it's the option. I'm just trying to explain how other because you're not alone. OK, all counties are facing this. So I'm just trying to give you some examples of what other counties have done and maybe it yeah that would we would like to see what that looks like but somehow to get me direction to and that comes to decisions um so i think the benchmark group is very the, the labor attorney is clear on leaving it the same but i think it's looking at do you want to weight it or tier it so we have one client that they just they provide it solutions for um entities so there's still a public sector um entity and they tiered there so they said that out of our benchmarks maybe our management positions are going to be in the top tier with these entities and the rest go in here because we can hire those positions you could tier it you could rank it to say we want to be the third best county paying um, looking at who you're benchmarking um, it does the board have appetite to recalibrate the pay grid and what would that look like to reduce some of the compression issues setting a pay philosophy, moving HHS to one grid, addressing grades 87 to 91, and then everyone wants to know when. Yesterday. <clears throat> so that's a lot of information. Um, are there questions, concerns? Well, let's see. So one of the areas I certainly want to look at is um, the possibility of recalibrating the pay grid to add more grades and definitely to reduce compression. Um, I see that as a big issue. We as the board definitely need to come up with whatever we feel our pay philosophy is and get that documented. And we're not there yet. Um, how long realistically, how long would it do you think it would take to move Health and Human Services onto one pay grid? Do we have to deal with the first pay grid first before we move them over? That's the chicken and the egg because we can move. I mean, technically, like you can move them over now, but you're probably going to undo some things that they had or create a lot of compression because you just have fewer grades. It would be nice to do to rip the band-aid off to clean that up and then move them over but we're working right now with them to update their job descriptions go through and look at where they would fit in um, of their positions do they have some positions that you know are really tight in their own system you know some of their you know how they're internally organized what that looks like so we're working on that right now while we're talking about this so i think that implementation day is when would you want to move them over if you move them over and now we could it's just maybe not going to look as pretty or be as easy it'd be easier to get a fresh slate and then move everything at the same time but that's my opinion um well i think easier and cleaner is probably a direction we definitely would like to go as opposed yeah. to more complicated because it'll be we're harder to there. add more positions into already compressed grid if that makes sense she's saying fix the grid first right yeah right i don't know if everyone behind me likes that but well i i i think though when i hear you say that i i think you're going to fix the grid knowing what we're going to bring in right so that the grid will work with what we're going to add to it Right. If you fix the grid over here and then you say, OK, now we're going to add this in, it still may not work, but we need to we need to understand what <coughs> putting everybody on the same pay grid does. Yep. So we need to evaluate this side. And then build the pay grid that works <coughs> to implement that. Yeah. So you have this is how I look at it. you have two grids right now. 
the county grid has some areas of improvement. So why would we want to move this over knowing that this grid's not working? So I would say fix this to where you're comfortable, then move it. And then if we have some issues by that, we'll just have to adjust those. I mean, because nothing is always super easy and there's always going to be some implementation that we have to work on. But I think the big thing is I wouldn't want to move from HHS over here knowing that your system has areas, that, you know what I mean? Like it'd be harder to buy into. Mm -hmm. Yes. But note that we're not, we're moving ahead with that. So when you're ready, we don't have to say, okay, now HHS, well, we got to wait for you. You know what I mean? Like I'm trying to get them updated job descriptions in whatever so, so that, that we can. Ready. Yep, they're ready when we are. Realistically, do you think we can do that by the end of this year? Or do you think that's more of a longer? <clears throat> I say yes. I mean, because the market we re we're already looking at right now, um, but it really, I mean, it comes down. So like employees like, Ooh, you know, but it comes down to a, where does that board want to be? How do we implement it? Making sure it fits into the budget. And then we still have unions that have to either accept it or, you know, or you just do non-unions a year one or however that looks. But for me to do the work, super easy. Implementation always is the issue because of how you want, like, because I could today say, here's here's where Goodhue County is in the 90th percentile. So here's all your market. We collected all the data. Here's where it is. Here's where the new grid would be at. And we could add step, we could add grades in. I could add steps in. That can all do. But then implementing it, there's a lot of work that has to be done on your end, kind of, is that where we want to be? How would that look? And then looking internally, does that solve what we said we were going to solve? Okay, and can we, or it, would it make sense to have a smaller committee of board members trying to help work on something like that? Because, I mean, it's so convoluted to try and get all of us together. And if we're all together, then it's Probably trying true. to come up with the simplest way to. Sure. I mean, it would be that would be great just to get even a recommendation. So let's say the committee says we're going to Tessa is going to create a grid with more grades in the 90th. Let, I'm just using that as an example, 90th percentile. Then we could look at it. That group could look at it and say, yep, I feel comfortable. Oh, th wait a second. This creates a compression issue right here. Do you know what I mean? There's more eyes on it, and then you can make like a final recommendation if that's what the board wants. I mean, that definitely can work. Usually we have like a project committee. Sometimes we'll have a working committee. Sometimes you'll have like your personnel or labor committee in there too. It's whatever works for the county. I don't do anything the same because everyone has different. But I think it's a good idea because you do have a lot of moving pieces and you have decisions to be made and you sometimes it's easier to edit somebody else's work. Oh heavens, yes. Do you know what I mean? For me to come in and say, here's an here's example A, then you guys can tear it apart. That might be how you figure out what where you want to be. Or saying we want to be in the 90th percentile is easy, but what does it mean numerically? Like where are do you know what I mean? So sometimes you need to see those numbers side by side. Um sometimes you need to see graphs. So I just need some kind of direction, then I can show you. And then I think it's way easier to edit my work than it is to say, we're going to work for six months and create a pay philosophy. Do you know what I mean? And then it might not do what you wanted it to. Yes. So the data always tells you um, kind of where you are. And then it's kind of, okay, you in your mind probably know who you need to be competitive with or above and where is that so we could at least start from there and then you can always adjust it so i have one city in the metro that they are at the 75th percentile they have 15 benchmarks but they're implementing at the 63rd percentile next year for non-union and then the 75th in year 2024 so they're just getting there a little slower but they're definitely they're i mean overall their wage grid is going up by like eight percent but it's not going to be year one and not everyone get, do you know what I mean, is going to get the same adjustment. So that's just different ways of implementing. So. so when you say in 
like the 90th percentile, are you talking about taking the benchmarks and that we would pay at the 90th percentile or 100th or 105 or whatever we decide? Yep, whatever. So Excel is amazing. It will literally do it for us. So we right now, the last time I came, I said where you were to the market average. And that is basically saying you take all the mins, the maxes, you average them out, and that's where it is. Some people could say that's the 50th percentile. Um, it's just saying you're going to pay above that. So if you said 63rd, Excel will tell you where those numbers should be. Then we calibrate it, trying to get the grid as closest to that as we can. Not every single position will be right on the money because we have thing called pay equity that we have to work with too. Right. But if that's our goal, we try to get them all as close as we can to that. All right. And it's just a different way of looking. I mean, you could say, you know what, our um, our benchmarks are where we at, we're at market average. We're above market, we're gonna go 15% above market average. That's another way of looking at it. So some entities will do that. Some will say, I'm literally gonna pick on Rice County and we wanna be 95th percent of them. So whatever they is, we pay within 5% of their min and max. If that's what your pay philosophy, everyone does it a little bit different. All right, so then is it fair to say that the foundation of what we need is pay philosophy? Or, I mean, I could show you what 90th and you could work backwards. Do you know what I mean? Like it oh, would be easy. engineering. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean to say, here's the 90th percentile. Here's what it would mean to your market. Here's what it would mean for each position. And you could say, we need to see that and to get our heads around that until we then say, yep, this is where we want to be or no, can we afford it? What does that all look like? Mm -hmm. um, if you guys, I mean, I can do anything. So the, so the last one you brought us where you used those counties in that list for comparatives, <clears throat> where we, did you get us to the median? We that, got us to the market. To the market. Yeah. That, yeah. that graph? That, yeah. that graph. Yep, yeah, to the market average. average. We, didn't, we didn't wait last time. No, no but, so, then, but as an as example, I mean, you guys have already said add more grades, so she heard that. Uh -huh. I mean, we've been talking about possibly transitioning off steps one and two and possibly adding one and two. She can show you what that looks like. Uh -huh. um, and it, if we want to be weighted more towards the counties that we actually lose people to, she can do that. I mean, that and how you do that is you either say we want to go to 90% of the market or we want to go to 90% or when I say look, go to, I'm saying look at, mm -hmm. look at 90% of the market or 90% of Olmstead and Rice. And if you did that, that that weights that heavier towards where we actually lose people. And also by doing that, then it, it compensates for us not looking at, not having a county like Dakota in our comparison group. Or Fillmore or Houston, right. where yeah. we really don't compete with. We don't. Yeah. Right. We probably don't compete. So I mean, we as an example, if you told her those, yeah. as an example, if you told her those three things, she can bring back an example of, of what that might look like. I mean, our our I think the other thing is that just our economy and what good you county looks like is not anything like um, quite frankly Wabasha or Houston or Fillmore or Dodge or we don't look like them at all they have different pressures for employees that, than we do mm -hmm. so I think you need a I think we need to really wait towards some of the counties that look economy wise similar to us or we're going to we're going to be behind the eight ball right away. Well, I definitely agree with that, that we also have to look at what is the economy of Goodhue County, County and what are the majority of the salaries mm -hmm. and literally what can people taxpayers afford mm -hmm. compared to what we would like to pay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I see that as a very, very fine line. Well, it is. It, it, it absolutely is. is. I think that the, the, the couple of things that, that I keep going back to where we've been, and um, we're at the beginning of contracts, and that was a hang up in the last go around that we weren't going to change people who were already in a contract. So if we go through with this and we talk about, you know, by the end of the year, that means we're in year two of contracts. Are we willing, 
is that a change in the board's position a willingness to adjust mid contract because if we wait till we might as well not do anything if we're going to wait till the end of those contracts because then we're outdated already so are you saying that if we come up with one grid by the end of the year then we have to go back and I mean that changes all the contracts that we signed we'd have to, we'd I, have I, to I think you would have to me. go back and and get buy-in from no. those that are in contracts otherwise if you wait till the end of the contract to put that in place we're already two three years, three out. years you basically behind. asked for like a mou that yeah. you could open it up they can choose to either go into the grid or not they yeah. don't nothing else is discussed at that point right. i've never seen a union not accept it no because chances are it's going to be higher right right yes right okay so i had a union person say well what about if we don't accept it i said well then you stay where you are until your contract. So you either say, yes, I'll take the increase or I'm going to stay. Like, that's your option. Okay. Well, so I, see that as so I need to, I think before we, before we go down the road as a board, we have to say we're okay with that or we're not. Because if we're not, then what you do is futile until... But we still need to see the numbers. That's that right. Get us oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. That doesn't mean we're agreeing to anything. That just means that if we're going to make an adjustment, it's not two years down the road. Because then it's out of date. Because right now, right. what you did the last time is kind of knowing the economy and everything, it's out of date now. It's just like your payment improvement. People drove on it. There was frost. There was, you know what I mean? So it's starting to deteriorate. Just because of timing. That's why we do this more frequently. Or eight that's dollars what, more per paint. That's why that's <laughs> why I, you're making our engineers happy, I think. Okay. That's why I'm I'm in favor of us continually looking yep. at this mm -hmm. so it doesn't go five years and yep. you're trying to make big corrections. Well, in the whole, we need to be more in tune to what the market is. And the market, the job market we may think it's already made the change. No, it's going to be making changes for the next. Right, because while oh, you guys are deciding this, other entities are making changes to their yeah. pay plans too. It's just because it's a competitive labor market right now. It you know isn't always the case, but it is right now. So it's an and the beauty of this market. is you can I can bring back like Scott said a couple of these options that might help like just to see it. What is the impact? Because maybe you know what I mean. And then you also have finance that's going to say, well, how are we going to pay for it? Yeah. Right. So that might we might say we want to be in one place. We might not get there in year one, but maybe it's year two. That's a heck of a lot better road than the unknown. Right. All right. Well, I personally would like to see us, if at all possible, to get to one pay grid by the end of the year. I don't know if anybody else agrees with that. I, I think that's a I think that might be a stretch to get all of it transferred over it by the end of the year. Oh, I like a good challenge. <laughs> well, that's good. I'm glad. And I say that <clears throat> quite frankly because budgeting has to happen in September. Yep. Right. So getting it done from now to September and having figured out that by bringing HHS in, we can make this all work seems like it's an aggressive timeline sure. to me. There, there's a lot of Maybe work that's already been you. done, though. No, I, Pardon? There's a lot of work that's already been done. So yeah, well, that's I mean, good. the first thing of, I mean, the board is there. So I heard Scott say, or in the board say, you know, we'd like to see more grades added. So by doing that, yes. that will recalibrate your grid. So that if I if you're at A, that will tell me <clears> where <throat> B is. So that's like <clears throat> option one. Like that'll tell us where, and then that could <clears throat> be like okay we think that's too competitive or not enough you know what i mean so that would be an easy one we can run real quick adding steps does the same thing because you're basically adding if you add two you're adding six percent to the top do you know what i mean because there's three and just just to clarify i think that the counties around us um that are doing that i think they've systematically dropped one and added one one year and then systematically dropped another and added another yep because i believe Rice, Steel, and Wabasha are have all done it or are in the midst of it. Yep. Okay. So it's so, not so it's not two at once. The, where I struggle with it, even if you did, nobody would be at that top one. No. So it's however you want to do it. But it's budgeting. You would say budget. That's super easy to budget for because you would know 
who's at the top, who would that impact? Mm -hmm. And I, I struggle with that part versus just shifting the whole grid. I, that's, I'll be honest with you, I struggle with that because because of all the issues with um, people coming in at the same level or, or close to the same level as somebody else. Well, if you just added that you shouldn't impact it then because you're not taking away yet. I think that's why you kind of do it slower. So if I add one, I wouldn't take away that one until next year and then I would add another. Do you know what I'm saying? So if I came in at one, I would still be at one all of 2023, move to to, you know what I mean, however that looks, but then you're hiring, you still have that some issue. But then, well, but and then the, in three years, that person coming in, is that the same as that person yeah. who's already been? That's where I, that's yeah. where I struggle because you can't, you can't slide people up the scale. It is, but if you know you're doing that, you can hire differently too. There's a lot of uh, positions that we can't even hire at step one right now. So, well, and, and I guess you know, before you say no, like where would it actually impact? Cause it really depends upon which jobs, I mean, if you said these are the 20 that we had open in 2022, how many are even close? 20? 20 yeah. at a time. <laughs> you could see kind of where people are on that. I mean, you could run a really quick pivot table to say, here's how many employees are at step one, step two. You know what I mean? Because it may not even be an issue. It might only be like three or four, and then you can move them or, you know what I mean, address them versus saying no to something we don't know yet if that's yeah, the market around us is doing that so we should look at it yeah no i i agree i just i struggle with that but part of it i will say, say that statement you just made if you have a problem with one or two or we can just move them we've been told all the way along we can't just move one or two not <laughs> moving them like grade wise move them a step move them a step change an anniversary because you date. basically would say we're rewarding you for your tenure and because of the implementation we don't want to cause a leapfrog or whatever i didn't mean move it the other way we, we have to move ahead. almost every time you do uh you know pay uh philosophy stuff you end up having to move somebody's anniversary date yeah. not a lot of people but some because even if i get it one day ahead of time that means the world to me sometimes so that, that's where people get, it's very personal, so you want to make, I didn't mean to move grades, so I just meant adjust. So just so I understand, so as you're working on, so as you're comparing and we compare to certain counties and we and we um, adjust that median to where it's higher than, how does, how does what the public's paying in our area come into play in in like skills into that pay grid? Or is it not part of it at all? So when you say public, do you mean like the private, I mean private sector? Private. I mean the private. We can industry. run, um, we have ERI data if you want to see like liked position. I mean, it's pretty hard with some county positions because you're just not yeah, going to have some. But for some of them, you definitely can pull private sector if you want to see where it is. And the nice thing about that tool is you can literally say geographic location or the whole state. Mm -hmm. So if there are positions that you want us to look at, we definitely can include Well, I that. think, I, I don't know as, I don't know as. That's where I think those. It. You can't do it for every position. I understand that. But I think knowing, mm -hmm. knowing where the private is compared to us. Sure. Has some bearing on where we need to go because it's local. Sure. All right, hang on, I'm confused. Why would we want to look at private because we're never going to be able to compare there versus the public sector and the other counties? Or don't I understand? Well, I, yeah, but, but we lose people to private too. We don't only lose them to other public. No, I realize that. But and you wouldn't but, have to average it in. You could spotlight it. Though, let's just—I'm just, just going to use the nursing for example. You could say, "Here's where the benchmarks pay in your area. Here's where the." All right, like appraiser, public nurse, public health nurse, and. You're not going to have a lot of positions, though. Like appraiser, you wouldn't find. I mean, a commercial appraiser, I guess you could find those. But some positions are going to be easier than others. I mean, deputy, you're. Mm -hmm. It's pretty hard to. All right. So, what do you need from us today to move forward to at least the next step? So, I hear yes, we want to look at what 
like a recalibration would look like of whatever we we don't know what the end is but we would want to recalibrate it so i can do a couple of examples to show you how that impacts where you are to the market meaning one add more grades so like those five if i added five to what your current is adjusted kind of what would that do so we have a this is where we are today where would b be 2024 that would be one adding those steps if we just add one i could do that that would show where we are today where we could be in 2023 and then what i put in there is ranking them so like if you did 90th percentile of your market or whatever the board you know just to show you how different that is and how it can still recalibrate your pay grid that might open up the conversation of where do we want to be how, how does that impact it and what does that look like can you show us a grid of where we would look like if we were at okay the 90th percentile of Olmstead and rice sure so we could see yeah that. yep and by doing that i would i heard we need to add more grades so i'm just going to do that in mm -hmm. the new example and the step because that's pretty easy i can either cut it off or not but then when i recalibrate it it would be to that and then you can see literally to your point where that one graph was you'd right. literally be able to see where we are today mm -hmm. where that puts us and then we can run the analysis of each position how that impacts each position okay hopefully my last question but that is if all right let's say we we're looking at 90th percent of um, 90th percentile compared to Olmstead and Rice. And what if we have some jobs that we know are very much under, but what if we have jobs that are above and we want to get to 90th percentile of Olmstead and Rice? Well, nobody's going to take less money, right? No. So if you're up here, then and we're already above, <coughs> then what do we do? I've only had one client that took money away. Normally you would, you could either, if your philosophy is you could freeze them so they wouldn't get a cold. Okay, until like the, we did the right probation got mm -hmm. stuck in that position. Mm -hmm. Or you okay. say they are where they are, but we're still going to do a cost of living. Sometimes it could be a percent of that. So if everyone got a cola of three, they might get a slower one so that the market starts to catch up to where they are. Okay. I do think we as a board have to be talking about the budget part of it too, mm -hmm. meaning um, we already I think are committed to a 3% pay increase in uh, each of the next two years with the unions. Right. And so to me that means probably the levy increase is going to have to be at least 3% already. And I, I, I could be wrong about that because I'm pretty new at this, but I think we have to be talking about well, what can the taxpayers really afford? And these numbers may be way higher than what the taxpayers will really tolerate or afford. It I would agree be. with that wholeheartedly. Uh, it's yeah. that, so I mean, that's that fine line yeah. about what can we afford based on what would be the amount. But unless I see a picture of what's right. the you amount have to know that we've what been it looking is. at. And, right. And it's then, easier to, it'll be easier for you to edit what I did to say, right. okay, we can't afford that, but if we went 5% lower, right? literally with our tool, you can, do that automatically. I understand that. So, so you, this would be a starting point. I think, so. I mean, that's at least a direction for us to give yes. you something to wrap your heads around. And if it's this whole group or a smaller group to make that, you need to decide that. But I think it's always easier to edit somebody else's work and to say that budget number is too big. So we need to go down and yeah. work, like you said, reverse engineer to fit what we can do. Is that number of what taxpayers could afford or within a county, is that something that you can do as well? Or is that something we have to try and figure out on our own? What, it, what, it, what the number is, we can tell you basically what a tax levy impact is. It wouldn't be 3%. You know, our, our wages are not not the whole budget, so. Okay, so that's percent of 3% wage increase does not equal 3% levy right. increase. All right. It's probably but I mean, I guess more like one. The other picture I need in my Plus mind is what is that fine line over? No, we don't have jobs in the county that are such high pain that we can afford it. So I mean, that's a subjective number, though. Somewhere. I mean, you can't. There's not. It's not a. This is it. 
and it no. doesn't go beyond that. It's a, well, it's a subjective number. But yeah. you'd know what your percentage was of people in the county who are paying more than 30% for their homes or for housing. Anyway, somehow I need to know that number or at least some right. find where that number is so that. Well, what indicator are you looking at? Well, that's what I'm asking. Okay. How do we, how do we looking, figure that are out? Are you looking at but, the tax rate? Or are you looking, I mean, what our tax rate number is and where that goes? Is that how you're gauging that? Because we've been at, we were at one time at what, 60% tax rate? And now we're at like 43, 44. So at one time we were paying 60%, now we're paying, or 60, and now we're down to 40. Look at, well, the, you want to look at, look what at the last budget and look at where our tax rate was and how it's came down. So where is that number? What is that number? Is it 48%? Is it 45%? Is it, I mean, that's where you're going to tell what your, what your taxpayer is paying. Yeah. Well, I th although I think taxpayers are more concerned about the absolute number than what the. But you're, not, you're never going to get to that point. Yeah, but that's what they're concerned about. Right. Yeah. Right. And they're all, you know, valuations change, everything right. changes. Right. The right. legislature's in session, it might all change by the end of that. I know. Yeah, you just never good. know. The, the one thing I think we have to remember is we did not make an adjustment to 87 to 91. Mm -hmm. What Tessa brings forward mm -hmm. is going to make adjustments to them also. But we haven't even implemented them. Mm -hmm. No, but we still have to know what it's going to look like. Yeah. No, but we haven't implemented them. So that's already a cost built in that we did not even implement. So right. you need to remember that. So that, it may that, look bigger because we haven't. That part it. technically would be in fund balance. Correct. But it's still, it will, it will it's show up. Money. It will be the number. Anything else you want to throw out? No. We don't have enough time for that. So. Okay. You have enough to move forward. I do. All right. All right. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. When do you? When do you? When would you anticipate wanting to be back with us? Like three o'clock. <laughs> I was thinking two thirty. Yeah. I have another meeting at three o'clock. <laughs> not that good. It would say probably a couple of weeks. We have most of the market analysis, so now we need to plug these numbers in. We'll, we'll set up something here. Yep. And either the two weeks or four weeks from now. So, I think this has been very helpful. Very good. Thank you. It's Thank much you. better in person. Yes. <laughs> Do I just leave this or? Yeah. There we go. All right. We are excused. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone.